<laughs> All right, so yeah, I'm Yaron. Um, I am a product manager at Facebook, and Jake asked me to come and talk about growth because I did product management for growth in Facebook for about a year and a half. Um, Jake, is this uh, something you want to talk about? Because these are your slides. <laughs> okay. Okay, so here are some stuff on product school. Um, yeah, so let me introduce myself. Um, Yaron, I'm a product manager at Facebook, worked on growth. Um, currently, I switched role, and now I'm product manager in ads, so maybe I'll come do ads talk sometime um, after I get some experience. Um, previously, at, I worked at eBay. I did structured data and SEO there. Um, I'm a soccer jun junkie myself, and I can train your dog probably because I was a dog handler in the uh, military. So uh, if you <laughs> train your kids. I have two kids, four and one. Um, according to their behavior, it's probably not a good idea that I'll train them, but <laughs> you can try. Um, I was going to ask how many of your engineers and product managers and whatnot, but Jake uh, stole my thunder, so I'll try to go up with some other question. Who here thinks he has the longest first name? Yeah. Nobody thinks he has the longest first name? Okay, so I'll take the victory with your own, um, which is probably not true. Okay, so um, I formatted this uh, presentation as a discussion. Um, I was promised a very engaged audience. So if it will be a discussion, it will be great. If not, we'll be done in five minutes. So it's a win-win situation. <laughs> okay, so here's the agenda for today. Um, first, we're gonna talk about why growth, why companies are even um, invested, are investing in growth so much, and what does it mean? Um, what are kind of growth metrics that companies uh, follow to measure their growth? How we're doing growth accounting, which sounds a bit boring because it has the word accounting in it, but um, it's really important because when you understand growth accounting, you can also understand what kind of growth products and growth tactics you can use. And then we'll have some uh, short exercise for you to practice in discussion. Yes? Sorry, did we get a copy of the slides? Uh, no, <laughs> I don't know, uh, ask Jake, uh, I'm not sure. We'll send out a follow-up to Okay. So um, let's start, and let's start with why growth. So here's the first point of discussion, a question to the audience. Um, you hear a lot of organizations talk about growth and have dedicated effort around growth. Um, but obviously, every organization in, the, um, in, in every um, department in the organization eventually wants to grow the top and bottom line of, of every of every company. So why do organizations have this dedicated around growth? What is, what is special about growth that's worth putting a team together around it? Anybody has like, th throw some ideas, some, some, some answers to that question. Money. Money is one, so revenue, okay. Okay, okay. What else? I think in a way it's a, it's a reflection of the company in a, in a lot of ways because uh, if the company is bringing out the right products that people like, that reflects in its growth. So I, I feel it's a reflection. More than th there is the side effect of monetary benefit, but more than that, are we going in the right direction? That is reflected in its growth. Okay. Okay, user acquisition, which is kind of a growth metric. I see a hand over there. Yes? Uh, we live in constantly changing world, and so in order to survive and essentially survive in the long run, you have to just keep growing. Okay, that's good. Okay, all are good. Yeah, one more over there. To go ITO. So in order to go ITO, to make money, you need to show growth. Okay. All right. So all of these answers are valid. Um, but I think y you got probably the closest one, the way that at least I think about growth, which is growth answers a fundamental questions about a product. And that is if you have a product market fit. Yes, if you have growth and you monetize that growth well, eventually you will make money. 
So you need growth in order to project future financial results. But you can grow without making money as well. Startups grow without making money by offering services for free. Okay? So what growth really trying to answer is do we have product market fit? And yeah, it's hard to drive revenue with product with um, it's hard to drive revenue without, it means, it means to say, without a product market fit. But you can have product market fit without revenue or without profit. Uber today is not profitable, but it's growing hugely, right? Um, and when growth is up, that basically means that your product is creating a repeating value for its users. So users are keep on coming back. And that that's really is a key thing here, okay? And that is why companies keep on investing in growth and asking themselves growth questions in order to understand if the product fit the market. Okay, so in order to know if a product fit the market, we need to have uh, a growth metric to know wh what is it that we're following to understand if we have the product market fit. And your growth, that's what exactly what the growth um, uh, metric should reflect. And it should also imply about future financial results, and that uh, relates to what you said about IPO. Um, yeah, usually when uh, companies go IPO is when they have a very uh, strong growth. Um, sometimes companies go IPO before they're profitable, because, but because they have such a, a good growth metrics, um, people still buy their stocks. So here's the next question. How you can, you have an organization, you are not as an organization now, how can you identify their growth metric? Ask what your business model is. Look, okay, analyze their business model. How else? Uh, user base, base. So you're assuming it's a user based metric, okay. So what is the goal of the company? So again, uh, analyzing the, the mission or the, um, the business model and from there deduce their growth metric, okay. Sorry? Okay. Yeah, over there and then here. Market share, so, so market share is a growth metric, but how can you identify if that's the growth metric of, of a specific organization? Uh, user recurrency. How many times users come back? That's a growth metric. But, okay, so maybe the question should be, is user um, acquisition or number of users are the growth metrics for all organizations? No. So the question is, how do you know what's the growth metric? So would it be uh, the company's mission statement? Like okay, you can look at the mission statement. That, that's a good one. Yeah, two more at the back, and we'll go for it. Um, I think uh, analyzing uh, the company's strategy over time and how that's changing their business would be really exciting what their metric number is. Right, so analyzing the company performance. So analyzing business model and then understand how you grow it. One more? Yeah, I guess it also depends on where you are in, where you are in the product development cycle. Okay, that's true. Maybe the growth metric. Too. Although you probably want to pick a growth metric that is static. And we talk about that. Uh, that stays with you for your life cycle. Okay, so all of those are good answers. The best way is to read their earning reports. We added 7.05 million net new members globally in the quarter against our forecast of 5.2 million and last year's Q4 performance of 5.59 million. This was the largest quarter of net additions in our history and was driven by strong acquisition trend in both our US and international segments. Now, if you open up um, earning statements of uh, most tech companies for sure, but also not tech companies, one of the first things they're talking about is the growth and the growth metric. So you can analyze their business model, but you can just really just read it. The companies are um, reporting on it, and if it's not um, company yet, if it's not public yet, Google it. What is Uber's growth metric? 
and you will find out. Question. Um, so what do you think of the strategy of analyzing all those different metrics you know about and then choosing the one that looks the best to present outward? And what if that's just the, that scenario? Well, I mean, you can bluff just a few times until somebody calls your bluff. By the way, one of my hobbies is poker, so yeah. Um, and it's a hard learn to, it's a, it's a hard lesson to learn in poker. But yeah, um, I think companies most of the time will, do, will if, if they'll, first of all, it means you, cannot, you can only bluff once because if you keep on changing your growth metrics, people will start asking, you know, what's going on. So it's not, it's not a sustainable tactic. That's why growth and monetization is not always the same thing. That's what I said. Yes, exactly. That's why this is not a certain, not necessarily revenue. And sometimes this appears before revenue in their statement, just to, to understand how much um, value companies are giving to growth these days. I think it's rare. Um, it could happen. Um, I, I don't have enough experience to tell you if I, I don't know any company that it happens. Usually, um, you need to decide on what is your growth metric pretty, pretty early in the process. Now, if you chose the wrong one, you should definitely change it. But if, <laughs> if you chose the right one, you probably don't need to change it. Because otherwise, you're just fooling yourself. If you chose a metric that actually reflects a product market fit, you should stick with it. And if it doesn't show growth, you should change your product. You shouldn't change the metric. All right. Anybody has any idea who's the company? Netflix. Right. Who said that? I thought so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know what I did, but that's not good. Jake, help. Oh, there you go. Never mind. Got it. Um, exactly. So it's Netflix. So. Um, uh, and obviously you can understand what the growth metric is uh, from this statement. So let's do a short exercise here. Um, let's go over organizations and um, try to guess what their growth metric is. So what's the growth metric of Facebook? Yeah, okay, I see that's, uh, yeah. Monthly active or uh, daily active users. There is a difference between monthly and daily and there is a reason why we do monthly or daily and we'll talk about that later. Okay, eBay. GMV. GMV, it's growth merchandise value. It's how much value, how much value, how many dollars are going through eBay. Not how much eBay is taking for itself, not how much it's making. What about Toyota? Exactly, you need soul. And finally, Visa. Number of transactions I heard. What else? Total payment, volume. Total payment volume. Yes, payment volume. Now you find something very interesting here. In eBay and Visa, those are two-sided markets, meaning that they, they, in order for them to grow, they need two types of users. They need sellers and they need buyers in eBay, and they need cardholders and they need uh, merchandise in Visa. And this is why their metric is not in terms of users or cardholders or buyers. Because growing only buyers will not grow eBay. Okay? So, and you don't want to have multiple growth metrics. You, have, you, want, to have, you want to have one growth metric. Okay? So, obviously, eBay, in order for it to grow, if, if eBay grows the GMV, it means that it's growing both users uh, both kind of users, buyers and sellers, and same thing for Visa. So this is why it's not always the case that the growth matrix is in terms of users or units that you sell or stuff like that. Okay, so these are some examples of growth metrics. Okay, growth accounting. At this point, I'm going to shift over and I'm going to use users um, because I'm more familiar with it and it's easier to explain. I think it, it's also um, easier to grasp. 
So growth accounting. So active user is a user that used the product over a certain period, for example, last month. So in order to do growth accounting, in order to understand how many users we have today, we need to understand how does the number of active users grow and how does the number of active users shrink. So that should be pretty easy. How do they grow? How, how do we grow? Acquisition. We get more users. How does it shrink? Churn. So uninstall, yes, it's right. User, you do shrink if users are installed or delete their account. But that's the important thing to understand here. This number shrinks even if users did not delete or uninstall the account. If the user stopped using your product, it, it shrinks. And that's important in order to understand the product market fit. Okay, so what's the formula? So active users today is new users plus resurrected users minus charmed users. New users, it's users that join today. Charmed users, it's users that their last day using the product was exactly X one days ago, and X being your growth period. So if we're talking about monthly active users, then X will be 30 days. And resurrected users are users that didn't use the product in the X days, um, in the last X days, but are using it today. So you're not taking into account the average time that users are on the site or just logging? Great question. So this is like time spent metric, for example. You should take that into account if time spent is your growth metric. But in this case, time spent. Now, it doesn't mean that the organization should have only one metric. Of course, the organization has a lot of L1 metrics and growth being one of them. Time spent, by the way, is um, a metric that a lot of organizations do use, but it's not a, it's not a growth metric, usually. Okay, so let's do a short example just to make sure we all remember our fourth grade math. So yesterday we had 100 monthly active users, which is users that used our product in the last month. Today, 10 more registered. Um, three users that used the product for the last time, uh, it was 31 days ago. One user that didn't use the product over 30 days, used it today. So the monthly active users today is? 108, exactly, okay? So this is how you do the accounting. Now, why am I going into this stupid example of accounting? It sounds weird. But when you understand the accounting formula, you can start understanding growth products. Okay? Because obviously, if I want to grow growth products, I can do a few things. I can build products or go in areas that help me to acquire new users. I can build products that help me to resurrect users that churn. And I can um, build products that reduce churn, okay? So when you start one want to think about growth products, if you know your growth formula, it's much easier. Okay, here I'm going to the whiteboard. Retention, you can think about retention as the opposite of churn, and we did not, it's not reflected in the formula per se, but in, Retention is, is critical to growth and it's critical for you to understand to know if you have a product market fit. Because retentions mean that users come and use your product again and again and again, okay? So, let's do this exercise. These are days. Let's talk about a company that only acquire users for the first 30 days. So this is day one, two, three, four, till 30, so they only acquire users for 30 days. So day zero, they have zero. Then they start growing, they acquire, they acquire, they acquire, they acquire, 30 days. And their metric for growth is monthly active users. What will happen in day 31? Start drop, who's, who's leaving? Some users that joined on the first day, and then the second day, and the third day, and so on, so on, so on, so on. Now, now they reach day 60. And at day 60, what they need to see is that it's becoming a little bit of asymptotic to the X line. If you see this, 
it means that you have retention. And it probably means that you have product market fit. The higher this line is, probably the better product market fit you have, okay? So retention is really key. And once you understand retention, you can start to analyze retention. You can see how retention um, is being affected by different features on your product or by different user characteristics. You can do beautiful things, okay? So this is really important to understand and to understand um, what retention looks like in, in an MAP graph, in, in a user growth graph. Yeah. How would you measure In percentages. So basically you're saying, okay, um, what is my, for example, um, 60 days retention number, 90 days retention number, year retention numbers, in terms of how, what percentage of user that joined 60 days ago are still active? So retention is a percentage number. What active, whatever your growth metric, growth metric is. If your growth metric is daily, then your retention is daily. And that, that, that's, how we, that's why I'm saying that daily and monthly, when you're doing users, there is a big difference there. Because daily retention doesn't really make that much of a sense unless it's something you have to use every day to, to use the product, right? For Facebook, for example, it's important to know how many people come every day. But if you think about growth, monthly makes more sense because you can understand retention better. Okay, so this is, this is kind of an example here. And yes, you have to do your cohort analysis when you're talking about retention, saying what's my retention for 60 days, 90 days, half a year, a year. Okay, if you have a year retention, you're in a good place. If you have users that still retain after, you, after one year you acquire them, in numbers that are significantly over zero, then your product has probably a product market fit. Yeah. So if you want to keep users taking in, so I have received so many notifications uh, from my, do you know somebody? And does it work? The features. You're, you're running ahead in the presentation, which is great. So yes, notification, for example, is a retention product when you think about it from growth perspective, right? Because with the notification, I can get you back into the product, back using the product. But actually, you can't always be defined with zero and one usage because what about yearly uh, people who are active or becoming active, if they used it one time last year and zero times this year, you know? If, if they use it one time last year and you're... It, so they're really just not active. The, well, they, let's say they used it at some point, then at that point, 30 days from that point, they're, they're still considered to be active, but 31 days after they use it, they stop. They're not part of your um, monthly active users metric anymore. Mm -hmm. So what about businesses like tax preparers where they, they only deal with users once a year? So maybe their, maybe their metric is uh, yearly active users. Yeah. Um, Maybe it's something else. I don't know. I need to go read into its reports. <laughs> I'm curious about um, using the product. You define it as I'm a consumer of the product. I just log in, check it out, or I would engage with the product somehow. That, that's something that you need to define on how you count users in your growth metrics. Usually, is it if you use the product. Um, on eBay, for example, let's say if you want to, to track active buyers, then you had to buy something. Just using it doesn't mean much uh, for eBay, I guess. Isn't that the same group as one product? Because there is something that users use, and then there is something that businesses use. So the growth metric should be same for the, like Facebook as a whole, or for different products, it will be different. So you can have a growth metric per product in your organization. You don't have to have one, I mean, usually organizations have one leading growth metric, but then each product should define their own growth metric. So again, even if you are at, at Facebook or eBay or Google, you build products, and just the fact that people use Google every day doesn't mean they use your product every day. So understanding your own product within the organization, how it's growing, it's important. Take um, 
I mean, Google had multiple products that didn't have a product market fit, that they didn't manage to grow. All right, so let's move on. Um, ah, there you go. Let's talk about um, growth products and growth tactics. So in a very, very high level, you have this funnel. I, this is a very high level. It's, it's, it's oversimplifying uh, things, but still, it has some value in it. How people become users. You have discovery, top of the funnel. Right? In order for people to become users, they need to discover your product. You have conversion, which means you take in people that land on your product but are not users, and you're making them users. So on eBay, for example, it could be people that land on your product. You need to convert them to buy things, or in Amazon. In Facebook case, in users land on your product, you need to make sure they log in or register, right? So that's conversion. And then you have retention, which means you need to keep the users using the product. And um, those users that fall off this funnel do not return, do not retain, you want to convert them. You want to resurrect them, sorry. And when you resurrect them, you want to convert them again because sometimes they're not using your product. So let's say somebody didn't use eBay for, or Amazon for a long time, and you manage to bring them back to Amazon, you still need to convert them, okay? So when you understand this funnel, you can start thinking about tactics and products to grow each part of it. And in different parts of organization life, you probably want to make, put more efforts in different, uh, in different areas. Obviously, um, if you just launched a product or a company, Nobody heard of you, you need to work on discovery. You need to get people to discover and to land on your product. So um, top of the funnel or discovery, these are tactics that aim to bring users to your product. It doesn't mean they're using it yet or you converted them, it's just for them to discover them, okay? And here you can use stuff like SEO, search engine optimization, so make sure you rank well on Google. Um, paid traffic is a very big driver. And paid traffic could be um, if you buy ads on Google, or you have a campaign on Facebook, or you have app install campaign and you drive users to your app store page and so on. Invites, so get users that are already using your products to invite uh, others. Partnerships, you can partner with products or organizations that already exist and your product provides some value to their users and maybe they will be willing to send some traffic your way. That could work. And I said Play Store and App Store optimization is the other thing you can do. Basically anything that uh, makes users to discover or land on your product. Questions about this part? Yeah. Is there any new feature that you recommend that, that covers tactics, growth tactics, growth products and tactics? Um, there's a book I read called um, The Art of SEO. It's 700 pages. I mean, it's a good book. Um, I think, you know, I, I just Google things and you can, find, <laughs> you, can find, you can find great stuff like online on that from really experienced people. That's right. I have one video about growth that I'll, I'll, I'll recommend at the end um, that uh, I think uh, if you're interested in growth, it's worth, it's worth looking at. Yeah. For example? Um, like if you create more APIs or um, so it's a different way of accessing your product? Yeah, sure, yes. I mean, if it, if it aims to bring more users to your product, then absolutely, yeah. Okay, so next we're talking about conversion. These are tactics that aim to convert non-active users to active once they landed on your product, okay? Um, here, it requires really deep understanding your conversion funnel. Like how users go through the funnel, um, what, um, what friction they have. Because it's really mostly about removing friction. Okay, it's about taking users that already are on your site, on your product, on your app, and make them convert. Okay, 
So it's mostly about using, uh, removing friction. Then you can, lot to, uh, you can think about stuff like site or load speed, um, the way you lay out your forms, how you color your button or you design your buttons and where you place them. Um, the value proposition you, go the, you give the users when they, they land on your product. Is it, do they understand it? Is, a, is, is it something that they can relate to? Um, how they go through the flow, simplifying that flow. It's really, I couldn't give you like concrete examples here because it really depends on your conversion funnel and you have to understand it. I'll talk about data at the end. This is all has to be very data driven, these kind of things. And data is the key for growth. Okay, any questions about conversion? Yes. First of all, you need to log your user journey. And you need to see where you have drop-offs in that journey. And to start addressing the drop-offs that you can address and that you have ideas on how to tackle. So the first thing you need to log, like for every user, just log their journey so you can aggregate the data and understand it. Now this is tough for, for companies that are new or that you don't have a lot of product usage. Um, but even then, you need to understand that conversion is your problem. You need to understand that people are getting to your products and they're not converting. Okay, so even that, you need to log at least that so you know that you have a conversion problem. But you really need to understand the funnel to see where they drop off, where they drop off. So you, you kind of invest a lot of time understanding the journey maps and, and the, the, do you also do like empathy profiles based on segmentation and, and segmentation. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about segmentation later. But segmentation is also important, especially when you get to um, certain size. Okay. And lastly, uh, tactics that aim to keep uh, users active. So this uh, requires a deep understanding of your retention drivers. Um, for example, um, I can think that um, a retention, and this is, I'm making this up, I, I, I actually, uh, I'm not sure if it's true or not. Um, but I can assume that the retention driver for Google is the fact that you search something and you find something that answers your question. So the ability to find the right answer to your question is a retention driver, okay? Uh, the retention driver at um, an e-commerce company could be the fact that you got the product that you asked for on time in a good quality. So having a good, for example, shipping uh, experience. I don't know if that's true or not, but what I'm trying to understand, to say is that in order to build retention products, you need to understand what drives retention. Um, user will stay active on your product if they find value in it. So the really the retention products is products that aim to increase the sense of value that you're producing for your users. Um, for example, it could be off-platform notifications. Somebody already um, said that here. Yeah, notification is a retention, is a retention product. If you now, um, if, you're, if you searched on, on an e-commerce company for a specific product and now we have a sale on that product and we'll push notification to you on your phone, you most probably can, will come back. We try to retain you on the platform. Um, contact point acquisition, anybody knows why I think, why I put contact point acquisition here as a retention pro, um, product? Why, why acquiring your contact, a user's contact point, like a phone number or email, um, why is that a retention product? Okay. There you go. If you have multiple contact points of the user, you have multiple ways to reach him and to get him back to your product. Um, and also to understand the new user experience. So obviously a lot of users that join, if in that, if in that first few days, first, first experience they have with your product, they don't find value, they will churn. So 
um, understanding your new user experience and how you drive value there and how the features or the experience that the users are having in the first few times they interact with the product, how those are correlating with the retention later on, will give you great insights in order to understand what retention products you can build. Uh, yeah. Think, so how do you find like a one-size-fits-all um, retention solution that works with ma the majority of users? So like, there are a lot of people that really hate notifications, and then there are a lot of people that, you know, are pretty welcoming to getting some kind of notification on like an update or et cetera, et cetera. So like, right. on the one hand, it works, but it doesn't work, so. So the question is that, um, if you're a product manager and you need to realize if you want to send notification that users that's about to churn or don't want to send notification, or not even about to churn, if something happens that you think the user may value on your product, and you need to decide if to send the notifications or not, what would you choose? Let, let me ask you, if they will not get the notification, will they know that you produced value for them? No, they wouldn't. Okay, so when you think about it globally, when you think about one decision, send or not send, like, like implement notification or don't implement notification, I think it's pretty um, important to know that, like I think it's pretty easy decision, implement notifications, because otherwise user. Now you need to, to decide what are the events that you send notifications on. Because not all events are valuable. Yeah, if you start sending too many notifications, maybe the user will just shut down notifications from your app. So you need to understand what are the events that drive value for the user, notify them on those events. So that just sending notification to the user that are meaningless or don't, don't show them any value, yeah, that will not help. That's what I'm saying. You need to really understand what are the retention drivers in the user journey because those will also um, dictate what kind of notifications you send them or how you try to bring them back in. So it's just a matter of like the quality of the notification. Y yeah, it's just a matter of the value that it creates to the user. What about uh, customer support? They, they receive a lot of complaints and maybe there's some value in uh, resolving those complaints. Yeah, I never thought about it, but uh, when you put it that way, you can definitely think about customer support as retention, um, as a retention product, in a way. Before you perform to value to the customer, for example, if Nets, like if there's a new feature added, say we still have someone doing some kind of premium, right? That feature can be added, and you realize all you have is a value. Because if you have a showing function value, then you're less likely to show. Exactly. That's exactly the point. Exactly the point. Um, now, right, why retention products are so in, uh, important is to retain a user is usually easier to acquire a user. Usually, because if you already have an active user using your product, they probably already found some value in it. Retaining um, an existing user should be, um, in most cases, easier than um, ac acquiring a new one. So that's pretty important. That's not true. It depends how you acquire the customer. So if you're acquiring it from organic means, it means he's either searched for, for a particular product service and he keeps coming on versus paid where you know you just came on because you clicked the link and you could acquire him, but you just don't find no value and he's only searched once or twice. Yeah, I think th that's true. That's why understanding the user journey and what actually drives value for them is important of that. I think in general, though, if somebody already used, you just kind of a, a use case where a user became active, didn't find value, and churned right away, yeah, that's probably true. But if the user already found some value, I tend to assume that retaining them is easier than acquiring new one. It's not always the case, I agree. Yeah? Curious, we didn't always have I, I, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, if anybody in the room has a good answer for that, please share. Yeah, here you go. What's that? Drones. Drones. <laughs> Maybe. 
Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you used to have direct mail, then you have email. I think, yeah, retention products evolve in technology uh, in ways you have to reach users. All right, uh, I have one in the back. I don't, I, I didn't have any experience with that, so I, I can't talk to that. I do have an answer for this, the sort of hinting one. I've seen that uh, conferences uh, bring some sense of community and some sense of uh, belonging and, and, and engaging with the product crews. And, 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 and for example, you have uh, VMworld uh, that brings together the whole community and that keeps the engagement going. I think that, that really helps in terms of retention. Great, so the value you are creating for the user is the sense of community. Now you need to communicate that value back to the user in your retention product. So when you, when you send them the next email about the next conference that you're organizing, make sure you talk about that community. But you already went through the process of understanding your retention, right. retention drivers, and, what I'm, and it's great. I was trying to make the point that you have to go through this process. Uh, I, no, <laughs> I mean, the, the reason is, is, first of all, I'm not here to talk about Facebook, I'm here to talk about growth, and um, the other is that I, um, I, ju I just prefer not to um, risk it. <laughs> yeah. When it comes to retention, for you know, B2C products, I, I think that's the most easy application of it, but in B2B worlds, it can, it, you know, I wonder if the same tactics apply there, right? Or, or could you ask an example, like for Slack, I think, or a, yeah. a, you know, like an ATS platform or a, sure. you know, something like that. How so like Slack, Slack is the, I didn't use it, but I understand it's like a collaboration platform for businesses. Um, the end of the day, you have um, people using it. Um, so I can assume that notification, for example, could be quite useful there as well. That, yeah. That's one. Um, so yeah, eventually, at the end of the line, there are you most of the time. Maybe it's machines these days, and then you need to understand how to retain machines. But at the end of the day, um, people are making um, decisions um, on what to use and how to use. So you need to know how to retain those people. Um, yeah, I'm sure B2B has like its own, its own nuances. So I, I didn't work in B2B, so uh, I don't have much experience there to answer that question. Yeah? Is there a limit to the number of retention attempts you make on productivity? Yeah, I mean, I think that's just um, probably, you can do that from user studies and to understand like where do users, wh when do our, your retention attempts are just becoming annoying and actually driving the opposite result. Um, you should have some product sensors and some, probably some studies in order to gather data to know how many retention attempts you want to um, apply for a user. And also, when a user is lost. Think about how easy it is today to turn off notification from a certain app. And then you're shooting yourself in the leg, right? If you're sending too many notifications, the user decides to turn off notifications from your app, that's it. Uh, you probably lo you lost a pretty important channel to retain them and to resurrect them if needed. So I would say even in users' cases, you need to understand that. I think to that point, I think it's really important to understand, again, the value proposition these notifications bring. So the question that I was going to ask is, um, so as you, yeah, like you mentioned, it's really important to understand the journey that the user goes through, and then you, um, using that as sort of facts, you, you probably arrive at certain conclusions in terms of these are the things that I need to do to retain, retain these sort of users. Now, do you kind of do A-B testing on these users to really yes. justify or even conclude, okay, yes. yes, this is? The answer is yes. I mean, A-B testing and testing your products is, is a principle that 
outside of code you need to apply. Um, just to understand if it's getting you to the right result or not. Yeah, in the back. That's a, it's a great question. Um, I think I like intuition because intuition comes from experience and experience come after you tried a lot of things and you know what's working and what's not. Um, um, in the data intuition kind of equation, equation I'm, a, I'm a bit more into data. Um, I, I myself, um, you know, try to launch or tested a few products that my intuition um, made me think they're gonna work well and they, they absolutely didn't. And I'm very grateful that I had the data to tell me that so I can either abandon them or, um, or change direction. So I think data is super important. At, at these days, today, um, on an internet company, I would hardly um, launch any product without data. Um, showing me that it's doing something good. Yeah, I think it helps when your intuition is coming from experience. Mm -hmm. So yes. Um, but again, just combine it with data. Just make sure that you have data pointing you to the right direction and then your intuition to make the right adjustment, I would maybe put it that way. That's how I think of things, but it's, it, it's, not, it's not necessarily saying it's the right way to go. I mean, that's what works for me. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. I mean, if the data tells you that email isn't um, isn't effective with that market segment, then I would send I wouldn't send email there. But it's a pretty advanced place you get to that you're starting to segment your um, population to understand what works and what not. So the answer. The answer is yes, if, if email doesn't work, if you find out already that an email doesn't work for a specific segment and sending email is either you find it's bad or it's neutral but it's costing you money to send, then I probably wouldn't send it. All right, yes. I think you're talking about conversion though, right? How you take a user down the funnel? Correct. That's so that, that, that's conversion. Taking a user to the next step of your funnel, understanding your funnel, it's what, at least in my, in, in my world, I call conversion, especially if it's the first time they're coming, right? right? Retention means that somebody already used your product and now you want to keep them using it. Um, I'm not sure. I think upselling is usually, again, it's a conversion tactic. If you go into a store and you go to the, um, to the register and you, you're, you're getting like up, you know, there's upselling tactics there, you're already a user of the product. You're already in the store. So that's why I'm looking at that. Um, I mean, sorry. That, that way you can look at it maybe it's also not a retention, uh, it's, it's a conversion. You want, you want them to, 
to buy something else of what they're doing right now. You want to convert them from um, user that buys $10 to user that buys the $20. But you're not retaining them. They're already there. They're already using your product. All right. OK. OK, one more. Users to adapt um, new things, new behavior. Sure. And yeah, just one point. So you're talking about user experience as a retention yeah. product. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, if you find out like when you understand your your retention problem, if you have a retention problem, understand your problem with user experience, then then it becomes a retention problem. So yeah, I think you know. User experience could be a conversion problem. It could be a retention problem. It really depends at what stage you meet the user. If it's already a user of your product and they churn and you find out that the problem is the user experience, that it's, then it's a retention product problem that you need to solve. If you find out that they land on your product but then they never use it, then it's probably your user experience can be a conversion product because they never used your product. You never got them to do what, they, what you need them to do in order for them to become an active user. Okay, last question before I move to the next slide. Speaking about data, um, when you have multiple products, um, product managers in a company, and um, you make some changes, the other, com the other product man manager also makes some changes, how do you know, like, you know, this is attributed to what you do? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you need to have a good A-B testing platform that divide the users randomly. Um, so the same amount of users that are affected by other products should be both in contest and control. Um, that, that would be my quick answer. All right, so let's talk about data just, just, just a little bit, because the point I'm trying to make is we can go over all these like tactics and products and so on, but in order for you to use these tactics and build products that actually drive growth, you need to really um, be data driven and to understand um, what the user is experiencing or not experiencing. Um, you need to, to ask questions like, where are my non-users spending their time? Right? That, that can lead you to pos potential partnerships that can drive uh, growth. You need to understand why do people fail to convert? And in that case, you need to really map out your conversion funnel and understand where people drop off. Um, who are the people that retain or churn? Who are they? Why do they churn? What, what kind of experiences they have? What's in common? And that can unreveal opportunities to prevent churn or drive retention. And when you start asking those questions and you already have a lot of users, you already have a lot of data, then you can start segmenting by country, the network the user is on, their age, the platform, language, the traffic source they came from. Is it paid or not paid? And then, and then you can, you can uh, even grow further. Companies that kept on um, breaking their growth ceiling, like Facebook, like Google, Uber, okay? You kept on, you know, if you look at Facebook growth, it was like they grow and then 100 million. Can we make 100 million? And then they, they mean 100 million. Can we get billion? They, they, they got a billion. Nobody thought they'd be, be getting a billion. And now on the way to 2 billion, right? Companies that manage to, to grow that way are companies that are very data driven and they understand the growth pro, their growth problems or growth opportunities um, from the data. All right, so that was that. Let's, um, that's the recommended video that I wanted to recommend. So I'm a product manager in growth, but this guy is a VP in growth <laughs> on Facebook. It's, his name is Alex Schultz. Um, He's, he's really a growth guru, um, and this video is public. He gave this um, talk in a series called How to Start a Startup, and it has multiple videos there, by the way. It has multiple lessons. It's a great resource. It's very experienced. People come and talk about different areas of a startup. This specific video is about growth, and I really recommend to watch it. Um, a lot of things you'll find here that I talked about, he talks about it as well, but um, he's doing it better. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. But uh, no, uh, it's, really, it's really a great video. You should, you should watch it. Okay, a little bit of discussion just to kind of 
So you guys have the uh, small opportunity right here in this room to kind of apply what we talked about and to, to see how that's syncing with your companies or other companies you think about. So uh, introduce yourself to the person next to you, whoever that is, um, and then choose a company, can be yours or not, and try to answer these three questions. What is the company's growth metric or what you think it should be? Maybe they have the wrong one. Um, what growth tactic uh, the company is using and what data does it need to apply great growth? So let's take like three minutes to do that and then like whoever wants to share will go three, four people and then um, more questions if you have or if you want to just mean go, whatever you choose. All right. Um, anybody wants to kind of share the company, what you guys think, just so we can have the discussion? Here you go, yes. Yeah. Uh, like when, when we launched in uh, Latin, uh, this is like three, four years back, we had like awesome product, we had awesome content, uh, but uh, at the time of market research, we, we might miss like uh, uh, reading the payment cycle of, of the country. So as a user acquisition, we had a challenge there, like a lot of people were using actually debit card investment to your and credit card. So, not only about your product, it's about multiple uh, streams like payments also contribute to this thing. But so, the reason here is just, that's a great example, is that payment is part of your conversion funnel. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we sorted it out and uh, after that it, it worked out like uh, we, we have a good acquisition there now. Cool. Yes, and that's a great example where you did the research and you find that conversion funnel has a problem with Latin America and um, you made the change and now it's growing, right? Um, so that's a, that's a, great, a great story. Um, I'm assuming the growth metric is uh, subscribers, yeah. right? Um, cool. Anyone else? I saw, yeah. Okay, um, interesting. Don't you think they need more data in order to get into the Indian market, in order for them to, I yeah? Can, I can comment on the Indian market because I'm aware of what's going on there. <laughs> <laughs> Pricing is a big factor. Yeah. So there you go. The entry right now is heavily discounting because it, there's no, it's not a one-to-one -one parity between the industry. Right? It's a different basket, right? So we are reworking the pricing to see how this, we can get the pricing down indirectly right now. Right, yeah. Great, great example. Anyone else? One more. No, oh, I have it in the back. Sorry, yeah, he was he was raising his hand before. I'm sorry.
th that's great. I mean, thanks for sharing, and um, I hope this may be useful for you to, to find the growth problem that's there. But that, that's, that's a great example. Yeah. So in terms of expansion, how important it is to look at your competitors, uh, what are they doing? So if, like, for example, uh, I'm Lyft and I'm looking at Uber, they're slashing prices. Do I follow them to slash my price? Or how important it is based on your competitor's actions? So I really think it depends on the way that your competitor is creating value for the user. So I think, yes, I think that in Uber Lyft, case it probably makes a lot of sense and you'll find these companies becoming very similar in everything like in the UI in the app in, in, in almost everything they do so I think probably it's important to know your your competition I think what is really important is to understand also what are the retain retention rates in your industry so to know if you're doing good or bad so I think if you're Uber or Lyft I think one of the things that you want to know is and that, I don't know if, if that is something you can actually get, is to know what is the retention, um, what is the retention rate in these kind of products in order to know if your retention is good or bad, if you're talking specific about retention. But it's also uh, important to, to distinguish sometimes. If you look at eBay and Amazon, they're both e-commerce companies. But if eBay tried to imitate Amazon, I mean, one of the, like, think about Amazon, I think one of the greatest value drivers they have is, is Prime, right? You, you get in two days. Um, they, but eBay can't imitate that very easily because eBay don't have their own um, warehouses to ship from. Their, their eBay is a platform that creates connections between, um, between um, sellers and buyers. So, I mean, there's no doubt there's competition but it's, you also need to be careful in terms to, um, when you imitate your, your competitors, because sometimes the value proposition is not exactly the same, although you are competitors. Uh, yeah. Add, oh, okay. I was going to talk about Cisco, but, but, but then I decided against it, because I want to add to somebody, somebody mentioned payments. And I think it's, uh, to that end, it's very important to understand kind of cultural nuances. Payments is an example. Yeah. And I can, I can cite this is again public information from, from Uber. It's to understand the broader patterns and behavior from a certain culture or from a, or from a certain geographical location. For, for, for instance, in, in India, they now allow people to book multiple trips at once because that's the broader pattern that people like to book multiple things, trips and be assured that, okay, I have another pickup waiting for me at my location, then at my intermediate point. Yeah. It's a broader, again, accepting uh, uh, cash. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that that's a great point. I mean, um, and that's why you need to start segmenting the data and to understand exactly where the product market fit, right. where the problem is. And the, again, the growth metric will not tell you where the product market fit is. The growth metric will tell you either you have a product market fit or you don't. And if you don't, you need to go and analyze the product in order to understand. So yeah, that's a good example. You, you wanted to say something? I, I think my question was similar in the sense of, you know, if you're going to roll out a chain, um, you know, how, how do we drive uh, a user's behavior uh, towards change and then how long should that take? So it really depends the size of the chain you're rolling out. You can roll out a feature that is uh, a UI change that you can see the good results coming in right away. By the way, um, semi-related, I hope it's clear that you, you, not every feature change you, you launch, you see a statistical significant um, uh, impact on your, on your growth metric. Your growth metric is very high level. And you sometimes don't feature that as important as they are, you will not see the stat sig um, live there. And then it's really important for you to understand what you're changing, what you're measuring, and how the thing that you're measuring is related to this. So for example, if you're changing conversion, let's say the simplest thing, you change the button color on, on the, submit, uh, the submit button on your forms, okay, to become a user. Super simple. Now, you probably will not see the impact here, but what you can see is an impact of the number of people that complete the registration process, okay? And then you need to know how these relate. So you need to keep on digging into data to understand that relationship. So it's, it's, I don't know if it's, it's 
extremely related to what you ask. Yeah. yeah. How do you feel about, like, for this example that you just mentioned, people maybe convert more, but it may actually reduce the retention because there is this, well, this is my button and I click it, but it also reduces it, right? Like, but what do you do with that kind of situation? Do you want to segment, you know, like, you know, this is making the, our data dirty or something? I mean, you need to find, like, a long term long-term connection between what you're changing and the and or what you're measuring and the impact on your growth metric or any metric it's not it doesn't have to be growth it could be any metric you like top level metric that you're measuring right um i think um you need to bake some hypothesis into that like changing the color of the button that people use to sign up to your product will probably will not impact how much they retain 30 days after um now you can test it by looking at the segments test and control 30 days after they were exposed to that um, experience and see how much they retain. So you, you, can, you, can, you can get that data. Um, but I think you also need to um, practice, like you, you always have some assumption baked into your, your thinking. And I think that's, in that specific case, that's a valid assumption. That it's probably not impacted retention. I was gonna add one point of thing, I'm sorry about this. Um, I think having a, or, or, or having a personal relationship or nurturing that is very important. Example of that is what Facebook does in terms of if they have a birthday, then they actually send you cards and whatnot. I think that personal touch sometimes helps. Uh, it may not work all the time, you may not have any relationship, but then it, 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 it's a factor. Yeah. Test it and prove it. I mean, <laughs> it, it could be. And that's actually not a growth product. It's a different product. But yeah, I mean, uh, that that's, well, actually, you can look at it as a growth product. OK, any last? Yeah. We can add with this Twitter. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> I don't think it's it's um, they are disconnected. I mean, you need to pick a strategy that will allow you to to drive growth. Um, so your strategy, like I don't know, if your strategy is to capture the U.S. market or to go global, I don't know what your strategy is. You need to pick a strategy that that going to drive your growth. Um, this is really this question or this kind this that presentation is very specific to when you already have your growth metric and how what does the growth metric mean and you know how to measure it so i don't think growth and strategy are like not two different things there um, you need to have a strategy in order to grow yeah just uh, one question completely unrelated with growth it's more uh, on product management so a lot of us here we're trying to get and crack into product management and uh, the question is basically what would you recommend us do in order go into product management coming from completely different backgrounds and changing careers completely? Right. Um, it's a good question. I, I myself didn't start my career as a product manager. I started as a data engineer. Um, I think you need to, I, t I can only tell you what worked for me. And I, I, I don't know if that works for, for everybody. But the fact is, I, I worked at eBay. I was a data engineer, then I managed a team, and I just pushed myself to do things that product managers do. So without having the title. So I started like back in the day on eBay, in eBay, we like product managers put a lot of requirements document together. We call it product requirement document. So I started choosing small products within my team and I put together this product requirement document. Then I, I went to product managers and I said, what do you think about that? Like, is that, it's good. What, what are your advices? How can I improve it? Get yourself a mentor, by the way. Find yourself a product manager that you appreciate within your organization or somebody else, and, and, and just throw off ideas by him. Ask him how he can like, help you 
also to, to advance it. That's also useful. And I tried to be a product manager twice, and I got rejected. And only on the third time, they said, OK, yeah, you know what, you're join the group. So I would say, like, don't assume that you need to have the product manager title in order to do product manager work. Start, start small. Start doing what you see product managers doing in your organization within your own area. Show that you can be a product manager. Learn that, and then grow from there. Um, th that that's what worked for me. Um, you know, I'm sure there are there are other product managers that that found a different route. So that's why it's also important to like get this off somebody. We'll take one more question. Okay, one more question. Here you go. I saw your hand first. Yeah, it's a good question. So I think product marketing managers is a, should help you. So it really depends what kind of product you you're you putting out there. I mean, if you're changing the layout of the form, for example, or something like that, probably you don't need a product manager. Product marketing manager, um, the way I I see it, is is helping you to um, get introduce the product to the market. So if you need to work with PR or you need to put a news post somewhere or you need to understand better the users outside, go talk to them, stuff like that, that's usually how we work with product man marketing managers. All right, so that was the last question. Uh, one thing, uh, also by the way, for, very important for product managers, feedback. So I, I don't know how you collect feedback, Jake, but if you, I mean, if everybody here has uh, Jake's um, email or I don't know how, how, how you, how you, um, so if you don't mind if them sending you some feedback, um, what was good, but also what wasn't good, so I can learn better. I mean, presentations are really important for product managers, and I'm going to use this forum to give me food feedback and uh, improve my presentation skills. So please, if you can, you don't have to, but I would really appreciate it if you'll send some feedback to Jake, and then I can uh, incorporate it in my future presentation. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.